Okay. Let's see if it works better now. So we're getting drop frames on Justin TV. That happens a lot. So. Setting drop frames on Ustream too. What is going on here? Okay. Uh, well, let's just uh, keep going and see if it works. Okay, we're back now. Um, please let us know if this is any better now. <laughs> uh, oh, so we need to talk a little. We need to talk and, and test this a little bit. It's like it's a talk show or something. I know. How about that? <laughs> so, okay, Eva is saying it's good now. Um, Eva, Eva, this is. Uh, are you? This is the graphic. Uh, yeah, she's she's artist? she's the lady who designed the uh, the logo for the show. Awesome, yeah. awesome. Josh was uh, just showing me uh, the logo, and so impressive, so Tolkien esque, uh, capturing the the vibe and even the time. So uh, kudos on that uh, illustration. Very impressive, yeah. Eva. Uh, okay. So it sounds like we're doing okay now. Oh, okay, good. Okay. Right so, on. So, sorry about technical issues. I'm going to have to do some weird stitching before we go to uh, YouTube <laughs> with this, but so be it. <laughs> Happens. Yeah, let me just make sure I'm actually still recording. Okay, I am. Good. Yeah. All right. I, I had a couple incidents where I forgot to record the episode, and uh, a good hour and a half was lost to the ether forever. Ah, oh, no. That was unfortunate. That's sad. So what were we talking about? We were talking about stand-up comedy. So. Stand-up comedy, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you need to be uh, miserable and suffering in order to be an effective stand-up. Uh, and I guess like a good example would be like, um, uh, oh, what's his name? Oh, Light of the King is telling us that she likes your Atari t-shirt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Representing, yo. That's how we roll. Uh, <laughs> I miss Atari. I actually, you know, I think back, it's like this... Uh, it's a more innocent time, you know, uh, I, and it was so much fun. And I felt like I was on that bleeding edge, you know, just being able mm -hmm. to play Atari. Had that yeah, big cartridge. I, and you I remember that. I, I had the uh, ColecoVision with the <gasps> Atari adapter. Oh. <laughs> I was the cool kid on the block. That's, that's freaking authentic, man. I know. That's the real deal. And, you know, you want to know how authentic I was? I had E.T. for Atari. I actually Whoa. had a copy. <laughs> Whoa. Yep. Wow. That's Never impressive. made it past the first screen. Never once. <laughs> But I was determined. Like I was, I was one of those people who was like, "There has to be a way to get past this first screen." And I spent hours just like trying to do it, trying to do it, and nothing. And thus began my long uh, disenfranchisement with video games. Oh, <laughs> no, I'm I kidding. see. I'm kidding. I love video games. I just finished playing uh, the new South Park game. Oh, how's that? Hilarious. What platforms is it on? It's on all of them. Everything. Okay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. And it's uh, absolutely hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jan is saying, I took a picture of Bilbo hanging from the cliff in AUJ and photoshopped in Cliff's face and sent it to his email and wrote, <laughs> Cliffhanger. Worst <laughs> joke ever. He hasn't written back yet. <laughs> well... Uh, in Cliff's defense, he's been in Sweden up until, uh, I think he's leaving today, so, um, I'm sure he'll get it and reply to it because, uh, I, Cliff probably appreciates silly humor like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, he, Cliff is uh, another host on, uh, The Wandering. He does Torn oh. Tuesdays. Oh, excellent. excellent. Him and uh, Justin, they uh, they talk about news and stuff. And speaking of news, we've got some big Tolkien news that came out this week. Oh, okay. Um, let me bring up a little graphic here for it. Uh, Tolkien's Beowulf is finally coming out in print after wow. 90 years. Wow. And most people don't quite realize how big a deal this is because Tolkien was one of the first people to translate Beowulf. He was one of the people who started lecturing about it and made it relevant. Huh. Before then, like, 
most people didn't even thought of Beowulf as sort of like an interesting little anomaly. Yeah. And he convinced a lot of the uh, scholarly elite that this was a very important story that should be studied. And by God, it was. Wow, I had and, no idea. Yeah, and so, yeah, he, he wrote a translation of it, and it's been sitting hidden away for 90 years, and now, May 22nd, it's finally getting published. Right on. And I am excited beyond measure for it. <laughs> <laughs> like, like it, I know I sound like a total literary <laughs> dork by saying that, but I don't care. I want to read Tolkien's Beowulf. <laughs> Do we know why it was shelved for so long? Um, probably uh, the family wanted to... Okay. Want... Uh, didn't want it to see, wanted to get out for a while. I really don't know the details of why it was sure. uh, hidden for so long. Sometimes people forget about it, you know, and it ends up in a maybe. filing cabinet or something, and then maybe, yeah. But yeah. it's a, uh, I'm I'm looking forward to that, and so it comes out May 22nd, and it is going to be our June book of the month. Nice. Uh, so plan that ahead. <laughs> plan plan ahead for uh, for reading Beowulf when it comes out. I know you all are going to anyway. Um, and another one of our uh, the one torn uh, celebrities, uh, Kelly. Uh, she uh, is um, she's a scholar of Old English. Wow. And she hosts another show that we do, uh, or that she and her sister does, called Happy Hobbit. And she's agreed to come on the show to talk Beowulf when we talk Beowulf. So that should be a lot of fun. That's awesome. Um, I've I've always been fascinated by the story. I remember the the first time uh, that I read. Uh, I think it was part of a school assignment, or they were telling us to read something, and that's what I picked, or whatever. <clears throat> but it inspired. So I do like uh, illustration, graphic design, that kind of stuff on the side. And that was one of the first uh, original characters. Well, I guess not original, original. They existed in word form. Uh, was Grendel. I was oh, yeah. so captivated by Grendel. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and I Stole the One Ring is now in the chat. Hello, I Stole the One Ring. Hello. Uh, you know, whenever you want to Should... bring it back, it's fine. But go ahead. And run <laughs> with it. You know, you you hang on to it. At least we know where it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, careful about wearing it, though. The, the hair falls out. The eyes get buggy. <laughs> Only after about five hundred years, but okay. Yeah. And at least, yeah, you got time. You so, got yeah. time. <laughs> um, and so Eva is saying that will be an awesome episode. I'm assuming she's referring to the episode where. Kelly will be coming back to talk Beowulf with us. Yeah. And that's not going to be till like, late June, so we got a while. <laughs> right on. Right on. So, um, so moving on, we've got a couple of uh, our normal Torn Book Club business that I always like to remind people about. Uh, we have our Rewrite Tolkien contest, and since it is a sci-fi month... Um, our theme for Rewrite Tolkien is Douglas Adams. Oh my god, I love this! <laughs> Most of you probably know this already, but you were telling me like about how Douglas Adams sort of... Uh, he, like, uh, I was... Exploded your brain. <laughs> it was amazing. Like, my teachers back in the day, they could not get me to read for the, you know... But they were giving me, like, Louis L'Amour. Nothing against Louis L'Amour. I'm sure he resonates with people. But ah, I just wasn't uh, connecting with anything. Louis L'Amour takes a very specific type of brain <laughs> I, I think so yeah. like it was just I like mean, an not, entire chapter of like laying in the grass yeah, waiting for not, somebody to come nothing by. nothing against him but yeah like you you really need to be into like yeah. old west stuff you gotta like smell boot leather yeah. like all day long to be able, uh but finally one of my teachers said you know after saying oh he's not getting into any of this he's like here try the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy just rocked my world. I, yeah. It was phenomenal. It, it really was, and same for me. Like, uh, Hitchhiker's Guy was totally one of those books. When I read it, I was like, my mind just exploded. Like, I, <laughs> I actually was like posting on Facebook earlier today about like this sort of geek elitism about. Um, like you're only a true fan if you have read and been inspired by this specific writer. Yeah. And I I, I said something about how like um like reading something and having it punching you in the brain. <laughs> and I'm like that that's how Douglas <laughs> Adams felt to me. It's it's uh what was that the uh, gold brick wrapped in a lemon? Oh, the uh Pangalactic Gargle Blaster. <laughs> that's what reading it was like. Yeah. Was Pangalactic Gargle Blaster. It really was. <laughs> <laughs> uh 
Yeah, endlessly inspiring, and I I think uh, just across uh, genres. I think the first short story that I wrote wrote after reading that uh, was actually, because I'd been reading so many westerns or whatever before that, it was actually a western that was inspired equally by Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy as far as, like, style and delivery, Mm -hmm. and then also Raising Arizona. Uh, the Cohen brothers. Oh, I film. I love raising Arizona. You oh god, so incredible. Uh, Barry Sonnenfeld's uh, camera work in that as the cinematographer, amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but those styles kind of converged for my first ever short story. So and it mm-hmm. continues to inspire me to this yeah. day. Okay, uh, Temple is saying I hate geek elitism. If people like something, they should just like it. There is no need to compare your love of something to someone else's love of something. Absolutely right. Wow. And, you know, and that even goes into, like, politics today. Oh, yeah. You know, with, like, equal marriage rights mm-hmm. and everything. Because that's we, basically yeah. what's happening is this elitism, like, the, the kind of people I love are better than the kind of people that you love, and so therefore yours is outlawed. Well, yeah. Well, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, we, we try not to get too political. No, no show. political. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, sorry. Um, but, um, but, yeah, like, I was... Uh, I like Knights of the Lights of the King there, Raising Arizona, so funny. It really is. It, <laughs> it absolutely is. <laughs> and uh, and Jan is saying, I would never compare my love of the Dark Knight to just to Josh's love of the Dark Knight. <laughs> uh, well, no, I should say the Dark Knight Rises. But, ah, the Dark Knight Rises. <laughs> yes. <laughs> There's a lot of love there, or uh, it's it's a long story. <laughs> All we right. seem to talk about it every episode. I'm not going to do it this time. You're not going to drag me in this time, Jan. <laughs> um, so what else is going on in the book club? Uh, we have our book of the month, again, with a sci-fi month. It's uh, Orphans of the Sky by Robert Heinlein, which uh, I still have not read because it will take me maybe a day to get through the whole thing and I want to put it off until the last possible second so that it's fresh in my brain when we talk about it. Nice. So, I haven't read that one. Uh, I was saying earlier yeah. uh, uh, Stranger in a Strange Land. Right, right. Uh, the only other um, the only other Heinlein book I've ever read was uh, Starship Troopers. Ah. Um, which I loved but um, one of one of my friends, um, David Gerald, who is uh, a big uh, sci-fi writer, he was talking about Heinlein and how reading his stuff is kind of like reading one side of an argument, um, which is very true in Starship Troopers. Like it's very it's very pro-military and doesn't really show too much of another perspective. Mm-hmm. But it's still a damn good book. It's still an incredible read. <laughs> How does it compare, like tone wise, with the uh, the movie version? Well, the movie is just a spoof of okay. like of like war propaganda more than anything else. Um, I mean, there there are various uh, uh, story differences. Like, for instance, in the book, uh, in, it introduced the concept of power armor. Oh, like guys in big suits. Guys in big robot suits. Um, That's nowhere in the movie, of course. Right. But, I mean, like, everything else that we've seen, like uh, Gundam, like, any giant robot movie, like, sort of draws its its inspiration from Starship Troopers in some way. And, like, even in uh, Aliens, we saw that with uh, the the power loader. Yeah. And... um, and actually, like I would say, Aliens is probably a more faithful adaptation of Starship Troopers <laughs> than Starship Troopers was. <laughs> nice. Yeah. All right, Aliens. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll watch that to get my Starship Trooper uh, book fix. Yeah, there you go. Okay. okay. <laughs> but it, it, yeah, I, I really liked it, and I'm looking forward to reading Orphans of the Sky. And Temple is saying, I've read the first half. It's an easy read. I'm assuming in reference to Orphans of the Sky. So... Looking forward to that. She's been doing her homework. Yes, for the book club. And uh, and actually, uh, Eva posted a picture earlier this week of uh, Orphans of the Sky on her Kindle next to a custom-made uh, coffee tumbler that she made that has the Torn Book Club logo on it. Wow. And I was instantly jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I'm jealous after seeing the logo. Like, yeah. You usually appears right where I'm sitting. Can I recreate it somehow? I, uh, uh, wait, let, I need like a hat here. Let, right. Let's see if we can superimpose it. Oh, there you go. So you're almost there. <laughs> my hat has to go over here. Uh, my hat. 
Um, no, uh, incredible. And mm-hmm. please consider me when it's time to do the dramatic interpretation of your logo. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try and get this hat thing down. Um, but, because one of the things that I always do is I'm always drinking coffee on the show. And uh, this one, I, I have a couple mugs that I go through. This one is my Ben Franklin 300th birthday mug. You love Ben Franklin. I do love Ben Franklin. I love him so much I wrote a book about him. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, and uh, actually, I I got this uh, because of uh, the book. Oh, wow. You know, I've often thought if only there was a way to, you know, marry the father of invention in so many regards with, like, time travel. Gosh, <laughs> that would be really exciting. Oh, you mean, hey, guess what? I wrote a book about that. <laughs> Well, somebody had to. Gosh darn it! Well, it, it seemed like it, it was uh, it was one of those what if questions. I was like, you know what? I'll, let's just explore it. So, like, I really like studied Franklin in uh, American history because I wanted to make sure that I got the character right. Yeah, and really, sort of like it. That was another thing. Was like sort of punched me in the brain. <laughs> like, it, <laughs> like it, it really sort of exploded my mind as far as like uh, history and of uh, the people of history. Because Ben Franklin is a fascinating person. Yeah. Like, really fascinating person. He's tying keys to strings and then attaching it to a kite in a lightning storm. How can you not be interesting? Well, okay, to be fair, he didn't actually do that. Oh, okay. Uh, he had an assistant do it. More brilliant! Uh, he had his son do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, alright. Uh, he, <laughs> he had a lot of sons? Uh, he had two. Oh, all right. Uh, yeah. That's more than one. I so think, you, you have I one to spare. Too. You've got like the uh-huh. spare son. But um, but it was also done. Uh, it it wasn't an original experiment. Like this was something that people had been postulating for a while that lightning actually uh, held electricity. Oh. And so the idea of this kite experiment had actually been uh, brought forward by uh, some physicist in France, I think. Huh. And and Franklin thought, okay, well, let's try it. Yeah. And so he did it, and he took lots of safety precautions. Like, there was no person actually holding the kite when it got struck. Wow, okay. And right. actually, the, the kite itself never got struck. It was just near the lightning so much that it caused enough of an electrical charge to go down the string. Wow. Yeah. So it was actually a much tamer experiment than most Still people... Still exciting. Yeah. Even if you've got, you know, it tied to a post or something, yeah. I'm sure you're there watching and seeing what happens. Yeah, like, it's like I, I hate to be, like, the guy who's like, well, actually, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, what was one of the most surprising things that you learned? Because, like you said, you, you wanted to capture him. What was the surprising thing about his personality that maybe you didn't know about going in? Uh, let's see. I think one of the things that I found um, most interesting about him was just the way he lived his life like he really lived his life very publicly there huh. there was little there was little about him that he kept private so he was tweeting a lot i like i actually like got into a discussion with this with um uh the actor who plays ben franklin professionally in philadelphia ah um because like i said because this was written back in 2003 2004 okay so uh, tweeting was not really a thing back then, <clears throat> but I thought like, well, if Ben Franklin were alive today, he'd probably be a blogger, and maybe he'd be on Friendster. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and the actor was like, I don't think he would. And well, he and, had publications, wasn't he? Always yeah, like putting out flyers. He, and he was, almanac? but it was like uh, one of the things that he did was he he would only do that if he was in full control of that business, uh. like. He ran the printing press. He ran the newspaper. Mm. Um, and so I think Ben Franklin would probably be more the person who would create a new form of social media rather than somebody who would use one. Wow. So he would have invented something like Twitter. Yeah. Uh, what's, the, what's the next thing coming out? What, what are we going to do? Uh, the video kind of thing? Yeah, Vine is taking off. Vine. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> three-dimensional... Uh, holographic projection of yeah. your friends list in your the room with you. Well, you know, I'm waiting for like the uh, the Google brain implant, <laughs> <laughs> and everybody seems to be talking about how much they would love torn book club T-shirts. Oh yeah, and I I do want to do that, and um, 
Uh, I do have a high-res version of the logo that could be used on a t-shirt. I'm going to try to get some done for uh, Comic-Con. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's enough time to get them done for WonderCon, which is in a, in a couple weeks. Mm. But I do want to get it done. Absolutely. <laughs> See, Eva? Uh, awesome. Mm-hmm. Awesome. And I also like, uh, who's this? Uh, the, the, the temple. Uh, uh, Benjamin Friendster. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes, indeed, sir. <laughs> Actually, ma'am. Ma'am. <laughs> sir, ma'am. Oh, <laughs> uh, that, that's okay. I, like, I, I, they're they're all regulars at this point, so I kind of know everybody. Oh, uh, I got gotcha. you. See, <laughs> so, I'm the new guy. Leave it to the, any flubs, including technical difficulties. <laughs> all his fault. All, all my fault. All his fault. <laughs> I'm st- around here stomping on cables. And- <laughs> It's all I, there, there's all sorts of craziness happening on this screen. <laughs> there is. There's actually like a kick line of clowns going on in the background. That's just for my own personal entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, this is an incredible studio audience. <laughs> Rocket clowns. <laughs> so, um, so let's uh, talk about. Uh, yes, uh, Rovan Deer is new. He's saying he's new, and I believe I've seen Rovan Deer in the chat a couple of times, um, but. But yes, welcome. <laughs> welcome, and Smam. Smam. <laughs> so, um, as, as I've been saying, March is sci-fi month here on a Torn Book Club, and I brought you on because you are a sci-fi geek just like myself. Huge. And I thought we could talk about like some of... Some of the bigger sci-fi stories, some of like the big okay. franchises that have really inspired us or that we're still huge fans of today. Like Absolutely. Me, for instance, uh, I, um, I'm i a huge Star Trek fan so much now that I work on it. <laughs> <laughs> I've, and I've talked about this before. I work on the Blu-rays for uh, Star Trek uh, TNG. We were just looking at these. Uh, mm-hmm. Beautiful. Beautiful mm-hmm. packaging. I mean, like mm-hmm. the whole nine yards. You know what? Afterwards, I'm going to show you an episode so you can actually see what it looks like in HD. It'll yes. blow your mind. I would love to because I was also talking about, we, we were talking about how when they when they edited it for air, um, they were editing it on tape even though all yeah. the originals were on film. Yeah, it was all shot on film. And uh, since it was uh, it was going to be on TV and it was going to go it was going to immediately go into syndication, they had to have it on tape to give to all the affiliates. So uh, rather than edit the whole thing on film and then transfer it to tape, they transferred everything to tape, edited the whole thing on tape, and then did they put the infe- uh, effects in on tape or on the film? Uh, they a lot of the effects were done on film. Uh, oh, okay, because That's it was good. all it was all uh, composite model shots. That was okay. done by Industrial Light and Magic. Nice. And so the models and everything, incredible detail on those things. Wow. Like, stuff you would never even notice. Well, even back looking at, like, Star Wars, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what is Temple we're, saying? We're, Every we're time look. you say Sci-Fi Month, I start thinking, buy them on Sci-Fi Con from The Simpsons. <laughs> <laughs> Good call. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, Jan is saying, I've never watched Star Trek except the new movies. Where should I start if I wanted to? Oh, Hon- that's honestly, a um, especially in the original series and TNG, the episodes are very self contained. So you can kind of start you where can, you want. You can sort of start anywhere you want to. Let me ask you this, Jan. Are you a fan of uh, the Twilight Zone, the original Twilight Zone? Uh, or original Doctor Who, which I imagine we might be getting to. Oh, we're we're talking Doctor okay. Who later. Don't worry. <laughs> so that's what I'm trying to gauge is maybe your appreciation for uh, sci-fi from the '60s, um, because mm-hmm. if in that case, if yeah. you're open to it, I would absolutely start with the original series with Star Trek. Yeah, I, I would too. And uh, I mean, I love the original series, but it definitely does feel dated. Yeah, like, if you're just getting into it now, like it it does take some adjustment yeah exactly and even with the classic doctor who and like i'm one i'm one of those jerks who didn't get into doctor who until the reboot in 2005 (laughs) sorry i'm also guilty of yeah but But, i mean i've gone back and i've watched a a lot of a classic who now back then um um I was, uh, Jan is saying he hasn't watched any of what you uh just brought up (laughs) oh 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 okay Well, then, uh, okay, but you're liking the new movies, uh, hmm. 
So probably Next Generation would be Pro- a place probably to TNG start. would be a good place to start, and I would start with season three oh. uh, because that's when it really starts to like find its pace. Is and there a particular episode? Because these are all fresh in your mind. Yeah. Um, some really good episodes of TNG. Yesterday's Enterprise, one of the best. Uh, Best of Both Worlds is a fantastic two-parter. Uh, the Inner Light, um, that's a season five episode, but is just as standalone. Um, let's see, what are some other good ones? Uh, Family is a great one, but you really need to watch Best of Both Worlds before you watch that one mm. because it deals a lot with uh, Picard's own PTSD over what happened with uh, when he's kidnapped by the Borg. Yeah. But it's it's a fantastic um, it, it's a fantastic uh, episode and a fantastic character study into somebody who is really supposed to be like just the noble, fearless leader, and like seeing him like really break down. Ah, yeah. Uh, you know, one that I was just thinking: if somebody is mainly like a fantasy fan. Uh, and not as strong a fan as sci-fi, maybe, and they're looking for a little introduction. I just stumbled across this one the other day, um, and I don't remember the name of the episode. Maybe you'll okay. have it. Uh, but there's the the ghost in Crusher's family. Oh, oh, God. That's that's a season six episode. We're working on that one right now. Oh, oh. Um, and I can't remember the title of it. <laughs> if anyone, of if head. anyone's a, a TNG fan out there and, and can Google that one or knows it, uh, let us know. But that might be a good segue if you're more like a fan of like fantasy or supernatural or something. Mm-hmm. That might be kind of a, a an inroad to Next Generation for you. Mm-hmm. And Temple is saying everyone loves the Inner Light as one of the more philosophical episodes, and that's a it's absolutely true. It is a very philosophical episode, but. I think it's just one of the best executions of that kind of story I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, for those of you who don't remember, um, it's an episode where Picard uh, basically gets zapped by um, some kind of satellite, and he he goes unconscious, and in his mind, he starts living the life of a person on this dead planet. I call it the flute episode. It is the flute episode. <laughs> And what was funny was there was a, an, uh, on, I think it was on the History Channel, they did this big special on like uh, a big Star Trek uh, auction, mm-hmm. and the flute from uh, The Inner Light was yeah. one of the items up for sale. No way! And so like they're interviewing cast and crew while all this is happening, and I think the flute sold for like some ridiculous amount of money, like a few thousand or something like that. <laughs> and... After they they go through the whole thing with somebody buying it and the fan just being like so happy, I got the flute from the inner light. They cut to an interview with uh, Patrick Stewart, uh, laughing, going, "It doesn't actually play." <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of disappointing. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I, that that would have been my reaction too. I would have been all stoked. I would have gotten home, and then mm. I'd be like, "Okay, I'm just gonna try. Just what? Nothing. <laughs> yeah, nothing. <What>? Nothing. <laughs> no, you know, if you pay a few thousand bucks for a flute, your lips never touch that thing. <laughs> That's also true. Yeah. So if, if you're if you're a good collector, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, just so you know, if you ever win an Oscar, like there's no clothes that you can't really play with it. It's oh, okay. too heavy. Oh, the episode that you were talking about with the. Uh, Crusher, uh, yeah. it's called Sub Rosa, according to uh, yes, Temple. that's right, okay. Sub Rosa. Mm-hmm. Yes, good, good catch there. Thank you. I knew somebody would know it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you had it. Uh-huh. Uh, but that that uh, I think I might recommend if you're kind of coming into Star Trek from that fantasy angle. Mm-hmm. I I would agree. Um, and the reason I ask that is because I have an episode that mm-hmm. I recommend to anyone who's like Doctor Who. What I don't okay. know if I like Doctor Who. Yeah. Uh, I've got I've got a few episodes that I use as my standbys for recommending new people watch. <laughs> what what's what's yours for who? Uh, well, the top of the list for who for me is Blink. Yep, that's it. Mm-hmm. If you want to know if you're a Doctor Who fan, go watch Blink. <laughs> Temple is saying I used to have a T-shirt that listed all the TNG episodes. Holy cow! That's 187 episodes. That's a that's lot. A big T-shirt. <laughs> Is it or, or it's really tiny prints. <laughs> My God. It's actually just like houndstooth, but each little design is a name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, that would be amazing. <laughs> All right. There's the next design project. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> I, 
it doesn't surprise me that somebody would create a t-shirt that lists every single TNG episode. It'd be hard I'm, not to. I'm, but I'm just surprised that it actually uh, exists. And yeah. She's saying, yes, it's printed really tiny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but it I'll used bet. to have it. I was going to say, if you have it now, uh, uh, snap a quick pic of Sub Rosa and, and send it up to us. Yeah. But used But to. no, okay, used to. Yeah. So, okay, not, not, can't do it. So, so get in your time machine. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've watched Star Trek. We know how this works. Get yes. your starship slingshot around the sun, yes. and you'll be good. Ignore the whales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can bring it back later. Mm-hmm. First, get to the t-shirt. Yeah. Instagram that. Dang, they didn't have Instagram then. No! What are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Temple is saying, the poor t-shirt died many, many years ago. Oh, oh I know that feeling. I've got a few of my favorite t-shirts have died the most uh, recent of which is one of my favorite Doctor Who shirts. Oh. Uh, it started to uh, fall apart. Oh. And it's it's my it's one of my favorite Doctor Who shirts. It was a it was a T Fury shirt. It was uh, an image of the Weeping Angels and the Silence in a staring contest. <laughs> <laughs> that is brilliant. I know, right? That's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> Um, but you know, to console you guys, both of you, a little mm, mm, digital dig- hug, group, digital group hug here. Um, you know that just meant that you really loved them. They were well loved. There shirts. you go. Yeah, they yeah. were. They were indeed. Yeah. And if this one ever goes away, I will be so upset. Oh, Stark Brewery Direwolf <laughs> Winter Lager. Brilliant. <laughs> I wouldn't mind this. That's what we're gonna do after the show. Everybody in the area, we'll meet up. We'll have some uh, Direwolf Lager. <laughs> There you go. Yeah, <laughs> there actually is a. I think there's a new um, beer flavor coming out that's like Targaryen. What uh, that? Okay. Yeah, I think hmm. it, I think it's called like Fire and Blood or something like that. But, mm-hmm. <laughs> but they're, that. they're doing like a, a testing preview or something like that somewhere locally. I got an invite to it. I need to find out when it is. Wow. Yeah, that's a good event. Yeah, I'm a huge Game of Thrones fan. <laughs> I am too, and I would tell you all about it, except it's sci-fi month. Yeah. But uh, next dragons. Month, but next month is going to be um, actually. This is a good segue into uh, the schedule for the show for the next few months. All right, because I've been working this out. Uh, this month is sci-fi month. Next month is going to be a uh, big franchise month, big oh. literary franchise, which uh, I should bring up uh, because we're having this little challenge going on uh, to find the next big literary franchise. Ooh. Um, and uh, apparently this weekend we might have a new one on our hands uh, with the uh, Divergent. Oh, uh, yeah, that that's true. Because it apparently has done really well at the box office, and they're already talking sequel. Wow. Nice. Um, I, I haven't seen it. I've I, heard uh, kind of mixed stuff, but it's I, usually from older people. Yeah, I, I mean, critically, it's doing very well. Mm-hmm. Uh, box office-wise, it's doing very well. Uh, so it's probably got some staying power. Did you get a chance to check it out yet? Not yet, no. Okay. Um, I haven't seen the movie. I haven't read the book. Okay. Um, but it's something I should probably check out. Okay. Um, yeah, me too. Yeah. So uh, the next franchise, is the that ne- what we The, ne- think the next one, um, well, the next one after Divergent, mm-hmm. what will it be? It's, it's kind of hard to, uh, well, okay, the... Um, the criterion for it can either be a, a book series that hasn't quite gotten um, its due bestseller-wise, or something that is a bestseller, or something that has been a big fan favorite for a long time, but has never made that crossover into uh, TV and movies. Okay. Okay, I've got it. Okay. I've got it. It's even, it even qualifies, as I would say, and, and maybe we can talk about this also, soft sci-fi. Okay, it's totally yeah. sci-fi, but I think it's like mellow. Like okay. if you're not that into sci-fi, does it apply to anybody here or here? Mm-hmm. Uh, why the Last Man? Oh right, yeah, you were talking about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which I have the first book of. Uh, I've read some of it. I mm-hmm. like it, um, but I haven't really uh, finished it yet. For me, it was a real page turn. Like in the mm-hmm. beginning, I think I was kind of like you. I'm like, oh, let me check this out. Okay, that's kind of interesting. And very quickly, because like I guess I didn't have much to do that day or whatever. Okay. I just got uh, Temple in this. raises a good question: Are we yeah. including ones that already have films made of them that are yet to be released? Oh, I does that qualify? I would say it does qualify I because so. there are, there are a number. It's a of, looming one. 
Yeah, there are there are a number of them that are coming out, and one that I like that is coming out as a as a movie uh, next year. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know if it has the potential to be the next big franchise, but I personally am really looking forward to it. Is uh, Miss Peregrine's School for um, Peculiar Children? Yeah, I've heard of this. It's it's a really interesting story. Like, well, what makes the book so interesting is that he has all of these uh, vintage photographs in it that tie into the story, mm-hmm. and and the story the story is uh, interesting. Um, and Temple is saying because I was thinking the Giver maybe, and oh. the Giver is a, another good one. And you know that's one of those books that, like we all had to read in school. I gotta say, I'm unfamiliar. I was not one of the chosen one. <laughs> the rest of you all got uh, the assignment. I, I I didn't get the memo. Oh, it's it, it's a good book. Yeah, like it's it's a, I would say it's like, sort of dystopian. Oh, okay. Um, um, I don't want to spoil too much about it, but okay. it's like uh, there's basically society is uh, through various uh, drugs uh, are made very timid. Oh, and very kind of a little very the same nineteen eighty four little little nineteen eighty four ish uh, little little brave new world ish okay um and it's about this uh this guy who is trying to bring people out of their complacency oh. and like it it's a it's sort of what you would expect like i'm I wouldn't say like I liked it I wouldn't say it's one of my favorite books ever. Uh, but they're making a movie out of it finally after all these years that's coming out this year and I have to say I was not that impressed by the trailer. Like huh. I haven't seen it. It it looked like just another like big budget uh young pretty people in the future movie. The only difference is this one has like some big powerhouse actors in it like Jeff Bridges and Meryl Streep. Wow. Yeah. Big fan of both. And you know what? That might be enough to get me in the door to at least see it, <laughs> to at least check it out. You know what was weird? Speaking of like trailers and how they hit, uh, the Guardians of the Galaxy trailer came out last week or the week before. Mm-hmm. And I remember the first time I saw it, I was like, well, this is kind of like Hitchhiker derivative, especially with the logo flying in at the end and stuff of the trailer. A little bit, yeah. And I don't know. Was and that and Jan, Jan makes a good point. Never trust a trailer. You're absolutely right, Jan. Yes. Yes. Um, um, and and I was like, I didn't feel that impressed. I was like, it st- kind of starts off Indiana Jones, and then it kind of ends Hitchhiker, and I'm like, well, it's, it seems very derivative. And then I watched it again because I was showing a friend, and I'm like, hey, this looks a lot better this time. Mm-hmm. And then I watched it a third time, and by the third time, I was really excited about it. Yeah, I I got really excited about it just on the concept alone. I've never read the comics mm-hmm. uh, for it. Uh, the only thing that I knew was Rocket Raccoon. Ah, uh, yes. And pretty much, like, him, he alone is the real reason most people are going to go see this movie, because <laughs> it's like, okay, we have a raccoon with a machine gun. Mainly it's And his best friend is a tree. Okay, <laughs> I'm in. I don't care what else is going on in this movie. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> and and for me, it was just like, I miss Howard the Duck so much, another Marvel property, uh, <laughs> that when Rocket was kind of, I was like, I was stoked for that. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Light of the King is also... Back to uh, Miss Peregrine. Ah. Uh, the pics in Miss Peregrine are kind of haunting, and you're right; they absolutely are. Um, I I saw a few of them, mm-hmm. uh, and they do. They have that supernatural element where right. it's like the old, uh, kind of hard to see, but you can tell something amazing is going on. Yeah, because like the whole concept of uh, the the book is um, this kid, his grandfather gets murdered by some weird creature. And he goes, uh, and it's like his grandfather is this person who has been telling all these stories about Miss Peregrine's School for Peculiar Children, and he's been talking about all these strange creatures, and he's been talking about it his entire life, and and the kid always thought it was just BS. He thought it was just stories his grandfather was making up. Yeah. But now he's... He wants to discover what this really is all about because clearly there's something real going on here. <laughs> and so he travels to uh, Wales, where the school was, and starts investigating it. And basically he goes through a time portal and goes back to the 1940s, right uh, right before the Blitz, um, and meets all the people from the school uh, that 
were his uh, grandfather's age. Holy cow! And and it it gets even more complicated than that because because these kids they all have special abilities yeah. like kind of kind of x-men like yeah and in order for them to be hidden and protected from a world that would vilify them they have been put inside a time loop oh i love okay i'm on board don't tell me anything else <laughs> i don't want to don't give anything else okay okay uh, i'm a sucker for like time loops and travel and mm-hmm. and anything like that like i it it's a very interesting story. I sort of felt like the the ending was a bit predictable, mm. but the sequel just came out, uh, which I really want to read. It's called a uh, Hollow City, I think. Mm, I like um, that. But it's uh, definitely like it. It, it could be a, it could have potential to be the uh, the next franchise, but I sort of feel it's a little too esoteric for a lot of people to really grab onto. Oh. What about uh, American Gods? Uh, the ending, like you were saying with the yeah. ending there, I, I don't know. Have you read American Gods? I've got it right here. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> for the for the viewing public at home. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, the ending of American Gods, it didn't quite stack up to the journey. There wasn't anything wrong with it. I, I didn't dislike the ending. But I agree, but, you know, I sort of felt like it, over. I, I sort of felt like it, it needed that because it sort of had this sort of like Cormac McCarthy, very... Very dark, very drab, very, um, very pessimistic view of things mm-hmm. where, where, where things just sort of happen. Yeah, and and so I sort of felt like that ending, while anticlimactic, fit the story well. Yeah, and it did, and it fit, and everything a little anticlimactic. I mm-hmm. think that's the word I was looking for. Mm-hmm. But don't let me dissuade. If you are out there and you have not read American Gods. Probably one of the better things that it's, I've read. It's one of it's one of my favorite books. It has some of my favorite monologues in anything ever. Brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant. And just the, the cast of characters alone mm-hmm. on this kind of like epic road trip. And uh, and they are doing um, a miniseries on HBO. Really? Yeah, it's like they might even turn it into a full on series. It's gonna be like ten episodes. I am so on board. I'm so oh, yeah. excited. Yeah. So you know what? That that could be that could be the next big crossover. Maybe we discovered it right now. Maybe maybe we did that. That one definitely has the potential, particularly on HBO with the success of things like uh, Game of Thrones and recently True Detective. Yeah, I think you know. Actually, I think this opens a, a door possibly for Gaiman, Neil Gaiman. Yeah, pretty much everything that he does potentially could. He's got a very visual way uh, in his storytelling, and yeah. it kind of it lends itself to films. Uh, television shows definitely and you know they're always kind of hit or miss like i thought Coraline was a really well done movie but it didn't do that well yeah uh well see there's a a particular flavor to him and i think maybe the closest he's gotten to maybe like mainstream taste but still being true to his gamanesque ways Mm -hmm. um uh, (laughs) I don't know if I just invented Gaiman-esque or not. It, it should be a word, but it's not right. <laughs> is uh, Neverwhere. Um, yeah, and that's that's one of his that I've still never read. And, really? And everybody recommends it to me. And really, I'm just going to have to read it. At Neverwhere is probably my favorite Gaiman book. Yeah. I love American Gods. Uh, its scope is epic. Uh, its its meanings are deep. Uh, the, the thought puzzles that are presented to you are intense but neverwhere somehow kind of almost seems his most pop uh and i don't mean that to diminish it but it's more easily accessible Mm -hmm. and he's still dealing with these you know you know gaiman-esque twisted kind of things Mm -hmm. um uh, so I would, and actually, if I remember correctly, it was originally a series that he and, was working on. And or Temple with. actually just said that Neverwhere oh. is awesome. The show came before the book, interestingly. Ah, enough. see, <laughs> but, simpatico right there. <laughs> I think we're vibing, frankly. <laughs> I don't know, uh, but yeah, and I haven't seen it yet. So you recommend the show? Um, I, it sounds like. I believe the show is on Netflix, or at least it was. Really? Um, and I tried watching it, but. It definitely like had that 1980s BBC feel to it. And this was a thing that I was going to say about Who also. Mm-hmm. I didn't come on to Who until the reboot. Um, I had had mixed uh, uh, success with getting into uh, British television in the past. Yeah. Although, and I, 
I don't know if this qualifies for Sci-Fi Month or not, but um, my one of my original favorite television shows. We can go thank, off topic. It's fine. <laughs> thank you, Dad, and thank you for letting us go off topic. The Prisoner. Oh yeah. Ah, oh, the that, Prisoner. That show is such a mind job. Yes. <laughs> It's a good one. I, I would mind job. I would use a stronger word, but there's big balls. There might be kids here. <laughs> Let me just tell you, huge. There's actual balls. Yeah, they're they, they, no they actual balls and stuff. Uh, yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um. So that was the one. Uh, ca- oh, and uh, uh, Monty Python. Oh God, yeah, I love Monty Python. So those were the things that I was able to get into British television wise. Mm-hmm. But it seemed like there was something. Uh, I don't know. Like it, the subject matter was something that I wanted to get into, but I the think- storytelling is slightly different than the American sensibility. Or at least it was for a long time. In in, in Doctor Who, well, it was it was definitely done more long form in classic Doctor Who. Yes, like every every story was actually a four episode arc. Yes, and and that that sort of felt like things were uh, uh, dragging a little bit. And but even when I came in on the reboot. Mm-hmm. There was something there I was watching. What's the actor's name? I forget. Um, uh, the first one? With or, the leather jacket? Oh, Eccleston. Eccleston, right. Yeah. So I'm watching it. I, I love him. I mm-hmm. love his doctor. I love everything that's going on. But I'm on like episode four, and I, I love it all, but I'm not feeling it somehow. I'm, I'm feeling a little resistant to it somehow. Mm-hmm. This is what I think I figured out. Mm-hmm. The conversion from the PAL frame rate from 25 frames feels weird to an eye that's been used to NTSC for so long. It, it does, and as somebody who works in post production, uh, with a lot of uh, with a lot of PAL conversions, because we do a lot of stuff for uh, for Europe along with a lot of stuff for America. So yeah. usually we'll see a lot of our shows both in NTSC and PAL, and the difference is jarring. Yeah, because there's a certain frequency that your eye is used to. So if you're used to PAL, I imagine there's also that weirdness with looking at NTSC and vice versa. You get used to it. Oh, this is what television looks like. Mm-hmm. So when you're seeing it at this different vibration, it's a subconscious feeling of of like something's not right mm-hmm. so it took me a while before i was actually able to be like okay no no wait the uh i now i recognize what's going on and i got into it and of course now though <clears throat> maybe i'm already totally used to it but i don't even think it's a worry as soon as matt smith started as the doctor uh i think they changed over the production so they're not converting from the pal frame rate anymore but i think they're shooting in 24 frames if this is too geeky let me know <laughs> and then they're converting there to pal and to ntsc and uh, we're that, used to that conversion of 24 that 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 could be and a lot of stuff is sort of being normalized now with um hd yeah we're so. all going to be on the same because interlacing is basically unnecessary now right right uh all of these things frame rates mm-hmm. all very unnecessary okay jan is asking is is the image different in different regions um it's a uh, uh as oh, far as size if we if we want to get into the technical side of it um the big differences between ntsc and pal are um the actual frame size mm-hmm. uh it's a little bit uh bigger this way a little bit bigger yeah, little vertically taller. in europe and the frame rate is less frame rate's less in europe so uh, and then the color space is also a little bit different, but it's it's very subconscious. Yeah, and and I mean that's that's sort of where like going to the Hobbit when they um, converted when they shot the Hobbit in forty eight frames. Um, I saw both Hobbit movies uh, at forty eight, and it's it's a very jarring difference. Yeah, and that's what a lot of people have talked about with it. Um, it does make for a much smoother 3D, I will say. It makes for a much more in-depth 3D. Let me ask you something. Mm-hmm. And on behalf of everybody that maybe had tried it and, and didn't connect or missed out on it. I, to this day, <laughs> I went to see The Hobbit in the high frame rate. Mm-hmm. And I, I still feel like all that this movie theater did, I still think they tricked me. Mm-hmm. Because it just felt like they were playing... Uh, the regular print a little bit faster. Well, you see, that's that's, that's what, it, what felt, it felt like. Well, that that's what it felt like to me too. Like almost like to, when I first saw Unexpected Journey, I went to uh, the midnight at the Chinese theater, mm-hmm. so it was forty eight three D, all of that. Mm-hmm. And I I swear to God, for the first ten minutes, I literally thought that there was something wrong with the projector. Like I was <laughs> I was ready to get up out of my seat and talk to the projection. 
to, to, to the projectionist and say, is there something wrong I actually did. <laughs> <laughs> I actually did. I was like, you're just playing this faster. This is the same print. You're just playing it slightly faster. Yeah. Um... But uh, what I expected was like when you mess with the hertz on the television and it, mm. it increases the refresh rate so things look a little bit too hyper real. Yeah. And that's what I was expecting. Mm-hmm. But what I was getting, it just felt like it was being played faster. It was yeah. a weird sensation. Yeah, it, it was. Um, so there's some conversation going on here. Light of the King is asking, is the image different on a UK version DVD or or it just depends on when it was made? Um it it kind of depends, because, um, I mean, I've done a lot of uh, UK DVDs, um, and usually for the DVD side, um, there will be a PAL version mm-hmm. and an NTSC version. Yeah, because so especially there is a with the DVD, yeah. it's, you can't, like, if you've got a PAL DVD player, you can't play NTSC, mm-hmm. and vice versa. Right, right. And Jan is asking, is it hard to find a movie theater in the U.S. with 48 frames? I would say now it is. Um, they they really uh, played up uh, the 48 frames hard out here for uh, Unexpected Journey. Mm-hmm. So there were a lot of theaters that were doing both 48 and 24. Especially in Los Angeles and New York. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There, there was a lot in, uh, in L.A. So it wasn't hard to come by out here in L.A. Um, you can throw a rock and it, it travels at 48 but frames. But with, with Desolation of Smaug, uh, there were definitely fewer theaters that were doing the 48 frames. Um, Too many people like me would complain to the projectionist. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think I think it's a it's a good experiment. Yeah, um, absolutely. It it definitely needs a lot of refining still. Yeah, but um, I I think it could be good. But uh, we were this is going back to uh, talking about Doctor Who and uh, Neverwhere. Oh, yeah, okay, yes, we kind of got yes. distracted there. Um, no problem. Um, so uh, no, I, I still have. I tried watching Neverwhere, but it was it was so 1980s BBC that it was really hard for me to watch. That was the kickoff. That was the, the kickoff power format yeah. and everything. Yeah. So um, and that was the same thing with uh, Doctor Who. And I think part of part of what uh, made it hard for me to get into Doctor Who when I was younger was one 1980s BBC uh, looked very cheap. It, even even 2000, if mm-hmm. I can say, mm-hmm. and please don't hate me, <laughs> but even those Eccleson episodes, like, yeah. I had to build a little bridge brick by brick to mm-hmm. allow for those effects today. I was like, mm-hmm. really, BBC? Really? Yeah. That's all you're going to do for these effects? I, I agree. Yeah. I agree. But uh, to their credit, now the effects are excellent. The, the, the effects are great amazing. now. Amazing. But I think that's only because the show took off the way it did and they're like oh we have an international audience let's let put mm-hmm. something into this um so it was hard for me to get into that the other thing was there was so much history to doctor who at that point because it started in 1963 and had been going constantly yeah <laughs> all those years and and like yes all the episodes are very self-contained there aren't many large story arcs you can watch one and you can get into it just fine but it still felt intimidating to me yeah and that was a that was something that was hard for me to uh to really latch onto and i had lots of friends who were huge into it yeah and like and like they had shelves full of doctor who vhs tapes <laughs> <laughs> this is how old school we're going <laughs> VHS. Yes, I remember the VHS. <laughs> Mine was on the eighty millimeter. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Sometimes we're minors out here in California. Yeah, well, you know that's how it all started. <laughs> <laughs> we're all just old prospectors yeah. somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Her, shucks. <laughs> So, uh, Light of the King is saying, I love 1980s BBC, like the young ones. And absolutely, I love the young ones. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like, I don't want to... We're just exposing our weaknesses within our love. <laughs> well, like, um, I think it, the, the thing that really jarred for me was, with 1980s BBC, was, like, you had the sci-fi shows with just really low budget special effects. And another example and it, of that it's is... it's distracting. The Prisoner. Yeah. 
But see, this is where I think, like, if you are creative or inventive with ever, whatever budget that you get, here's a huge failure, I think. I was thinking about this the other day. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Once Upon a Time series that's yeah. playing right now yeah. is they have a decent budget, but they continually reach beyond what they're able, 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 yes. able <laughs> to pull off. And they they continually fail at that. Uh, we can get into the writing too, but that no, be that, well, I mean that thing. that's kind of why I gave up on it. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm always uh, uh, when you take uh, so the prisoner, they mm-hmm. had whatever budget that they had back there, right? Mm-hmm. And they're like, we need this, you know, huge ominous uh, monster that's basically keeping him a prisoner on this island, right? And they're like, uh, yeah, what's in the budget, lads? That's that's my English guys making a show. They go like this. I don't know. Okay. Why. What, what's in the budget, lads? <laughs> and they're like, oh, we've got five quid. And and then he, oh, well, what can we do for that? Uh, well, I've got um, I've got this big balloon. And that's gonna be our monster. Yeah. How much does that cost? Four quid. Hey, we're in on the budget. <laughs> that's right. All right, coming in under. Uh, so that's my re- re- recreation. Uh, but they basically they they came up with a very creative solution to the budget constraint. Mm-hmm. And I think when you use uh, any uh, any any little box that you have to fit into to your advantage, you actually end up with something that's a lot more creative than it could have been if they're like. I, I agree. You know, here's tons of money to do whatever you want, mm-hmm. which I think might be happening with Once Upon a Time. But in that's the happening States. with a lot these days. Yeah. Like there's there's like. One of the things that I that I really don't like too much is that special effects are so pervasive, and mm. due to the horrible way that they they do the pricing and the paying of VFX houses, which is why so many of them are closing these days. Yeah, they're coming in very cheaply now. Yeah, so basically, I almost wore my green shirt. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so people now sort of feel like they're only limited by what they can come up with in their heads and then they can farm that idea out to somebody who will make it real yeah. as opposed to you had this idea but you only have these finite things you can do to make it real so you have to work within that and that mm. fuels the imagination a whole lot more yeah i think absolutely uh looking at like what ridley scott pulled off with blade runner yeah like to me those effects like up until just like so recently, I couldn't still couldn't see holes in. It. I was like, "This is amazing!" Oh yeah, I I've got the uh, the Blu-ray, the Final Cut Blu-ray. Yes, and I actually got to see it uh, uh, in a big 4K projection on the big screen. It's and that amazing. that opening shot of LA, it looks like it was done yesterday. Like it still holds up today. It That's how good it is. And see, he had a box. No matter what the size was for uh, the amount of budget he had, he's like, okay, this is what I've got, and this is what I can pull off. Uh, We were talking a little bit earlier about Legend, uh, another Ridley Scott film. Mm -hmm. Um, Clearly a different budget for that one, but he looked at it, and it almost looks, it almost has the feel like you're watching a play on a stage or something. A little bit, yeah. There's a little bit of this stage thing. So it's a little bit unreal or surreal, depending on how you look at it. Clearly, he was taking the budget that he had available, and he's like, okay, here's what we can do. So maybe they couldn't go out on location and dress, mm-hmm. you know, forests for it, but they could build these sound stages, and that would... Be. So when, you, when you're able to think inside that box, I think that's where the best creativity comes absolutely. from. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, Jan is saying, CG is used way too much now. Oh, this doesn't look... This doesn't work. Let's just do it on the computer later. And that's that's absolutely true. Uh, the company that I work for is actually mostly a VFX house, mm-hmm. an effects place. And uh, so we have lots of jokes and lots of uh, effects-related humor. But um, on on our bulletin board at one point, somebody had put up a, an editorial cartoon and... It basically said what producers think a VFX house looks like. And the image was a console that had three buttons. And the buttons were explosion, dinosaur, and cheaper. (laughs) It's so accurate. If you work in the industry at all... This liter- like literally, this is the impression that they give. Like, yeah, just make it cheaper, or just make it explosionier. Yeah, push that button. And yeah, make make the explosion button. Like, I can mean, you make a dinosaur explode. <laughs> Great, do that one. Cheaper. All right. 
And, I mean, like, that's, I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent, but, I mean, that's a lot of what I deal with working in Blu-ray and, uh, and, uh, uh-oh. Someone got a black screen. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Everybody else okay? Black screen. Black screen. Uh-oh. No, oh, we've got a black screen. That's not oh. good. So we're, we're seeing this, this trouble as it develops. Mm-hmm. This whole thing here, troublesome. Yeah, this is this is quite troublesome. How is it on the uh, the Justin TV? Okay, just oh. to give you guys oh, like it's an frozen. idea, it's frozen. Oh, it's frozen. On oh, Justin TV. I'm not even moving over there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But this is kind of like like if you can picture like NASA control center. Okay. Uh, let's try. Uh, hang on. Let's try refreshing. This is the baby version of that. I think he can launch like satellites. No, nah, I can't do that yet. What? <laughs> no. Nah. Isn't that one next to the dinosaur button? Isn't that satellite? <laughs> Hang on. I'm I'm refreshing the page. He's literally launching happens. a satellite for this now. He's not literally. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> what is happening here? Nothing is right. When everything's wrong, uh-huh. nothing is right. <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming you can still hear us. You just can't see us. So I'm going to stop the broadcast and try and bring it up again. So hang on. Okay. Okay. You know what? You know what? I think it was the Justin TV stream that was screwing everything up. Dang you, Justin. (laughs) You'll pay for this. Uh, yeah, they don't have very strong servers over on that channel. Are are we okay over on, uh... Well, I just brought up a... I just started the Ustream broadcast again. So let's see if it works now. Once we get past the stupid ad. <laughs> are we all watching and listening to Cheese right now? I don't know what's going on. Well, we've got sound, but there's no pick. Oh, there is pick. Is there cheese? Well, there wouldn't be sound on this because there's... I have it muted. Oh, okay. All right. Still no picture. Interesting. So it's like radio. It's like, hey there, welcome to the grand old days of radio. Okay, uh, now they're saying they can see us on Ustream. Oh, okay. So there we are. Okay. I see us. I see us. We're like smaller digital versions okay. of us. All right. So I think we're back now. Since I, You know what? I just stopped the broadcast over on Justin TV since there was nobody over there anyway. Forget about Justin. <laughs> I don't know who Justin well, okay. is. Well, okay. And how he ended up with the last name TV, frankly, I don't think he was born that way. Just saying. I don't know. There's Mike TV. Oh, dang it. <laughs> He's, he's got me there. That's my TV. <laughs> okay. So. And Ed TV. All right. So. That was bad. You can hear us. You can hear us. Ba da ba da. Pixelated Minecraft versions of yourself. Yes. <laughs> like I had to. Oh, there. Atari is my tie. There you go. Oh, you have an Atari tie. Awesome. <laughs> I need an Atari tie. Right? Like, uh, Back to the Future? Instead of, was it two? Or I it was three. Uh, was I it think two? they were two. It was two when they go to the future. Yeah. 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 I'm going to have three, and I'm going to always wear them like this. And then only people who are Atari fans will know what my ties are. That's there you go. Plan. There you go. There it is. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Wait, it's replaying what you just played. What? What? Uh, okay. That my, I don't, my I don't know what's joke? happening anymore. No, uh, Ustream is... Oh, we're and getting a rebroadcast. It's replaying something, and then it just went dark. I don't know what's happening. 
Okay. This recording is going to be awesome, though, for later. Yo, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Wait, you just... I'm, oh, I'm stopping again. I have tech troubleshooting. Yes. <laughs> There's it's, a whole bunch of technology going on here. That's that's what I'm looking over here. Josh has this, like, you know, command center <laughs> that's, like, happening over here, and it's, uh, it's uh, transfixing. Uh, to say the least. Okay, let's try lowering the resolution a little bit. Which it won't let me do. Oh, we um, only get the best. And let's try that again. I feel like there should be like a musical interlude or something. I know. Do you have any <laughs> sitars or like <laughs> xylophones? Uh, I, I do not. What do I have on my phone? I don't have any music on my phone either. I'm what's that? What's that thing with the water in it or whatever that's called? Uh, and I think it it's like it looks like two frying pans and it has like these prongs and you play it with like a bow. Uh, and I think it was like the in Star Trek or whatever for the theme for the original series. Oh, uh, okay. I'm just if anybody Wait, are, are you thinking of a theremin? <laughs> oh, but oh, I might have been combining descriptions, but that's the one where you go. Yeah, that's that, a, that's, proximity. that's a theremin, yeah. But there's a thing with, like, water, and you play it with, like, a bow. If anybody knows what I'm talking about, shoot me. It's got, like, the metal prongs that come up in a circle, and you play it with uh, a bow. Am I crazy? Is this not a sci-fi instrument? I don't know what that is. What is wrong Roast here? Roast it in dragon fire. That was the last thing I saw. I don't know who said that. That's a... Uh, I hear you. Ravandir is saying that. Uh, I see and hear you again. Oh, good! I do have neither of those for you. Uh, Temple still has black. Uh, if only my Merida bow had really pointy arrows instead of suction cups at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's going on here. We've, we've lost everything. It's, it's, all, it's all gone. Okay, I'm getting rid of Justin TV entirely. What? All, all black too. and no sound. And no sound. Oh, God. The sadness. Wait, it just reloaded to just, see. Just reloaded to see if it helped, but no. But no. And that's okay. a you streamer. Okay. There's so much sadness here. Yeah, this is... This is crap, man. Ugh. Uh, that was just me. Uh, I just reloaded to see if it helped, but no, because we're getting nothing on the stream over here. What is wrong? What is happening? And back. Uh, maybe. Maybe. Black again. And back. N Reloaded and it's okay now. Rolfmo? Uh, yes. Ah. Okay, Jan is saying he can see us. You can see us. Can you hear us? Wait. Can I... Maybe I, Can I see you guys? Are you there? I can't see any of you. <laughs> <laughs> I still can't see them. I know. Where's that button? Uh, that button has not come yet. <laughs> I heard sound and now commercial. Oh, see the cheese. I knew the cheese was coming. Yeah. This is the cheesiest show, man. <laughs> they have cheese right in the middle. Okay, I'm just going it's to... It's called a commercial break. You guys yeah. are all familiar with, you know, how television works. Welcome to Hollywood, kids! Yes, exactly. <laughs> jazz hands. <laughs> all that jazz. What is happening? Come on, tell some jokes. Okay, now I see them. Oh, now, come on, tell some. Oh, uh, okay, now you see us. Uh, okay. So a duck, uh, a construction worker, and a rabbi walk into a bar. <laughs> that's that's it. That's all I've got. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, Hard joke. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is why we don't do stand-up comedy anymore. <laughs> <laughs> We didn't quit the business. The business quit us, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> okay. But so, we did excel in synchronized sipping. Yes. So. Yes. So, you know, we have that going for us. <laughs> so I think we're okay now. I'm okay. You okay? We're okay. All right. We're, we're all okay now. Okay. We're all okay. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so, um... 
Where was it? Uh, you what, tried to watch about? the Neverwhere series. Yeah, didn't quite get into it. Yeah, um, the effects were hard to connect with because of the age of the program. Yeah, and that and that's kind of how I felt with uh, Doctor Who uh, mm-hmm. early on. Um, ditto, ditto, ditto. Um, but you know, now I now I love it, and yeah. I'm, and I'm going back and I'm rewatching Classic so Who, awkward. and it's a. Uh, it's actually more intriguing for me now. Like, just I think mostly because they keep referring back to it in mm-hmm. in the new one, and so part of me is like, okay, I want to learn more about what they're talking about. Like, and it's, even, even when it's just like like little throwbacks, and it's a little bit different. Where, like, let's say for example, uh, Next Generation reconnected. I feel very well. Star Trek: The Next Generation reconnected very well uh, with, but it felt uh, okay. How do I describe this? It was separate. From the original Trek series, it was a whole other beast mm-hmm. containing similar rules, right? Of uh, right. the universe and everything. Mm-hmm. And then later on, it mm-hmm. kind of reintegrated more with the original series, right. with having cast members and things like that. Okay. But it was kind of a different. Oh wait, I stole the one ring. Is leaving. Bye. What? Bye, I stole. I'm sorry. Remember about the ring and hair loss and eye structure. Mm-hmm. You'll be all right. Yeah. <laughs> Five hundred years. Okay. Thank thank you for coming. Bye. Um, so, uh, so you were saying... Um, oh, oh. But who maintains... Doctor Who maintains that connection with the history the whole time, I yeah. feel. So yeah. the reboot wasn't even necessarily a reboot as much as it was a continuation. Oh, remember we were doing the show a little while ago? Right, right. Well, we're off of hiatus now. Right. The show is back. Um, <clears throat> that's a little bit how it felt to me. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, and... Actually, like, in TNG, they had a rule that they were not to, like, refer back to the original series in any way. And they only ever did it once. Um, oh, in, no, sorry. They did it, like, maybe two or three times through uh, the entirety of the show. They had, um, they had Dr. McCoy in the uh, pilot episode as sort of, like, handing off the torch. Um, the second episode, uh, The Naked Now... Um, um, they referred back to uh, this same thing happening on the old Enterprise, and then not until season six, uh, relics when they bring Scotty back. Uh, which I love that episode. I like that one, but of course I'm a fan of engineers from way back. <laughs> that, that was my Scotty. Sorry. There you go. <laughs> hey, it's as good an accent as he did. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't mean to disparage James Doohan. God rest his soul. He was a wonderful man. I love it. It's infinitely charming to me. Yes. And it was my introduction to the Scottish accent. <laughs> so there, yeah. There you go. And uh, Light of the King was asking about Star Wars earlier. Ah, okay. Yeah, we haven't really talked Star Wars too much. What about Star Wars? What do you think of the new movie's potential versus the prior films? I am infinitely excited. I I'm I'm highly excited about it, yes. Here's the thing. And, and and let me know what you think also. But my impression is this. I love Lucas. Bless George. Bless him in the highest hosannas or <laughs> hoochie mamas or whatever it is. Um, but I think that he may have... What's the way to put this? Uh, grown overconfident? No, that doesn't make quite sense. He lost, uh, disconnected from yeah. a piece of himself creatively, and what that is, I don't know. Right. Um, it, he just needs to kind of be established. So I, I would agree with that. Yeah. Whereas uh, the first three films that he made, which were the second three, right. chronologically in, in the series, in the chronologically, yes. brilliant. I think it was a collaborative effort where he had the vision right. and the story well, arc. I, I would say definitely um, Empire Strikes Back was very much a collaborative effort with between him, Lee Brackett, Lawrence Kasdan, and Irvin Kershner. Like, and I think that he relied a lot on his actors to be providing and mm-hmm. trusting their instincts. Right, right. Because if I was to say what the weakness with Lucas's now he has billions more than I do so you know take whatever I say with a grain of salt but his only failing may be in dialogue I I would agree or di- main failing I would agree with uh, dialogue and I sort of feel like um, he's he became far less trusting of his actors yes, later in life. Yeah, yes, like as less as trusting a, as a director. Yeah, like because um, his arcs are fantastic. 
The, I, th- I thought the arcs were good, but, you know, honestly, I sort of felt like the story arcs in The Clone Wars was way better than the prequel movies. Now, are you talking on the grand arc or, like, the individual characters' interaction? I, I would say both. Thing? I would say both. Because, for me, this little thing, it was exposed as a weakness in the new ones. Because mm-hmm. the individual little interactions yeah. were lacking for me. Very much so. Whereas the arc I was still engaged with. I, I was engaged with the <coughs> arc to a certain degree. The problem was, like, because... Um, the dialogue was so bad and the direction of the actors felt so amateurish. It was really hard for me to like get on board with what was happening. It was really hard for yeah. me to because like a lot of it, especially with um with Anakin's turn, like that's supposed to be a very sympathetic, a very empathetic, heartbreaking character moment. Mm-hmm. And I didn't feel any of that. Yeah. Because we had two movies that really failed to build up to that moment. Here's actually this thought just occurred to me. First time ever. <clears throat> I actually think that Lucas could benefit by going out and kind of doing what all directors in Hollywood or wherever kind of cut their teeth on is Go make some music videos mm-hmm. and some commercials, yeah. and kind of get reacquainted with the equipment and the and the craft of telling a visual story. And I think he could really benefit from that because his storytelling is yeah. not a fault. I'm never going to fault him for that. But just the you know specific little visuals and 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 how he, he you know what else he needs to go to a lot more dinner parties. Yeah, that's what I think. <laughs> Take an improv class. Well, you know, learn on, about honestly, human interaction. Honestly, at this point, you know what George Lucas doesn't need to do. Any, anything any of that anymore. rest on your laurels he, he's got his empire now and he's good to go sit back and, and enjoy and and that's why it. and that's why i think like it's uh it's good that he's sort of putting episode seven in the hands of other people and i gotta say like uh, disney you know it's had its ups and downs uh, but i i have to say disney is on a very strong upswing right now huge Huge upswing. Mm. Uh, everything they're touching feels like it's going to gold. I haven't mm-hmm. seen Frozen, but apparently it's the best thing. Well, Frozen since... was amazing. I loved Frozen. <laughs> <laughs> See, um, um, I I loved Tangled. Uh, yeah, I ended Tangled up... was great. That was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's that influx of Pixar folks into the Disney family that is kind of like probably reinvigorated the entire thing. But you know, a lot needs to be said for uh, Kevin Feige and um, Marvel and what he's been doing with yes. that. Yes, because uh, a lot of that is him. Agents and- of Shield. I don't know if you've been watching. But it's kind of coming around a little. Agents bit. of Shield has really, really come around the last few episodes. Yeah. Like I would say, it, now it is becoming the show we all hoped it was going to be. When I was it hoping started. this is where it would start. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I mean, it it, it took a while to get there. Probably yeah. a bit longer than I think it should have. Yeah. I don't know that there was a lot of groundwork that was laid that was necessary in order to get to this point. Yeah. Um. And Light of the King is saying that she works for Disney, so she likes to ask questions like this and like. And like I, I think Disney is doing a fantastic job with these properties. Yeah. And so like, I mean, very my, glad to have them. Have my Star my Wars. one criticism though is uh, tapping J.J. Abrams to direct Episode Seven. And here's and here's why. Okay. J.J. Abrams is the safe choice, mm. and Star Wars is one of those very rare properties where you can basically do anything with it. And it'll still make a billion dollars. <laughs> That's true. Like and like this is this is one of those movies, this is one of those franchises where you can really take a risk and you can really like you can really do something just crazy and amazing with it and it'll still work out in the end for you. I just pictured a, a clown walking in front of the theater goers with like a, a boom box and it like plays the Star Wars theme and he just starts throwing fruit at people and it's still <laughs> going to be like, people, oh my god, yes. interpretive Star Wars clown fruit throwing. But, but I mean like you have like a lot of these like cutting edge auteur directors like, I mean I would love to see like what Darren Aronofsky would do with a Star Wars movie. I'd love to see what David Fincher would do with a Star Wars movie. Well, the other thing is, is that you have this opportunity, and maybe it's not a bad idea to go with, and who I would say, because uh, I can talk about J.J. for a little bit, my mm-hmm. thoughts and feelings on that, mm-hmm. um, but he's kind of proved himself to be the safe choice at this point. Yeah, so he's he worked at it, um, and maybe it's alright to give the main storyline to him, 
But like you're saying, the universe that was created by George Lucas, a mm-hmm. man who could sit back happy now, <laughs> uh, is so expansive that you can tell and you can tell a Seinfeld like story in Star Wars, right? And they've got their starship and they're like, "What is the deal uh, with these, uh, you know, lightsabers?" Um, now, so you could have a whole bunch of like spin-off movies and like mm-hmm. side storylines. It's like now, a Marvel. That's universe. a very good point, and and Jan is making the same point. It's it's a risk that will have to work for if Disney wants twenty more sequels, which is what they want. And you're right, and you're and you're absolutely right. Um, but I I sort of feel like okay, like having J J Abrams as the safe choice for Episode Seven, and like I sort of feel like they're they're kind of like backing away and trying to do the more safe fan friendly thing now with um uh bringing lawrence kasdan on to write the screenplay which i mean he he gave us empire strikes back they ain't no small potatoes yeah um but it's also something the fans will appreciate yeah um uh having having the story for episode seven focus primarily on han luke and leia uh, rather than on the next generation which is what you would assume episode seven is going to be um, but this is this all seems to be in service of doing what fans want. Well, I hope, and in, in if I see where you're going with this, one of the things that I hope is that they're not going to end up going with, uh, you know, this goes back to the new, for me, I'm connecting with the new uh, or the latest uh, Indiana Jones, mm-hmm. where it seemed like maybe some people that were involved at the produ- producer end of things we're saying, all right, what do we need to do to reconnect with the nostalgia and stuff like that? And they made some decisions that maybe were less in service to the story and more in, in their feeling of like, oh, we can pander to the fans by having these elements. Right. And like there was only one point in that where I felt like there was enough of a fan pander and it was so... There, there was a certain bit of fan pandering that was so well disguised that most people who weren't big Indiana Jones fans never would have gotten it. Yeah. And that was um, when he's talking with Mutt about riding with Pancho Villa. That was an episode of the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles. <laughs> <laughs> and so any, everybody who watched the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles just like punched the air right at that moment. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> um, but so I think that stuff's valuable. You know, it, it is valuable so long as it's not overdone. Exactly. And, and like that's why I have a problem with Star Trek Into Darkness. Oh, because that's an excellent example, man. Because the the fan service in that, particularly in the third act, was so overdone that I it was done I, wrong. You know what it is? I, I felt so pandered to that I actually got a little angry. It's because it's when it's fan pandering, not done by a fan. Right. That's what it is. As mm-hmm. long as we have fans working on Star Wars, mm-hmm. because that that was the problem. And, there. and that's and the thing. They've J.J. Abrams is a Star Wars fan, much admittedly so, much more than a Star Trek fan. Exactly. He came to Star Trek. The a lot of the people involved with the new Star Trek movies have come to Star Trek and come to have a respect for Star Trek. But I think that this is where the problem was in Into Darkness. Mm-hmm. It was fan homaging or or giving back to or pandering or whatever word you or, want to use. Or like trying to prove your own fan prove credentials. Prove your metal, yeah. yeah. By a non-fan. Mm-hmm. Or somebody that was so new to when, it they didn't understand honestly, the historical significance. You can't just flip that window. You can't put Spock and Kirk on the other sides of the glass and have them repeat the same. That's so disrespectful. I love and, the movie. Love and, the movie, though. Yeah, like for like first of all, like with that first, yes, it's disrespectful to one of the greatest scenes in Star Trek history. Yes, and it also lessens the impact of that scene because yes. you know for a fact yes. Kirk is not going to stay dead. Yes, it's just oh my, I just it was that hurt to watch. Not for the reason that the filmmakers wanted. Mm-hmm. It hurt because I'm like oh. Oh, you're really disrespecting here. Oh, ah, mm-hmm. oh, this is painful. Oh, just yeah. get this scene over, please. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, but you know, I, I had less of a problem with uh, Sherlock Holmes showing up as Khan 
you know, I kind of had my suspicions already. Well, so. n- no, Khan was like that was the worst kept secret in Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knew that was okay. Khan. I just wanted to make sure we were all on the same page. Yeah, because yeah, like we um, all knew that was Khan. Like there was no getting around. That. It's the second movie. Hmm. Let me think. What are they gonna and, do? And that that was the other thing. It's like the second movie. Does it have to be Khan? Does it have to be the second movie of the af- made after the second movie? Star no. Trek fans? It, it doesn't have to be. They could the, have gone somewhere there, else. There were so many other stories in Star Trek so that are many. just as intriguing as Wrath of Khan yes. that they could have gone to. Yes. Or stuff that was done poorly that they could have reimagined yes. better. Like, I, I, for one, would love to see Cybok return in Ooh. this in this universe with a destroyed Vulcan and see how he handles that because he is such a revolutionary and he is such he he has the potential to be a truly violent terrorist yeah 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 and I mean okay Star Trek 5 definitely one of the worst of the bunch but <laughs> but, but that intriguing but that, character but that character had so much potential yeah yeah and I would have loved to have seen a revisit of that character in this new alternate universe yes uh, you know, something else that could be interesting for... Well, I don't know. Even as I say it. But I, I was just thinking... Uh, what is it? And Temple is saying they could have done something completely new with Star Trek also. Absolutely what? they could have. What? <laughs> Original? What? <laughs> what? I don't know. You know, I'll be honest. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I trust them to do something original yet. In the, in the first movie, I'll say this. I have one bone to pick. If you know me, if you're watching and you know me... Uh, which is nobody. But <laughs> which is none of you... <laughs> be a couple you know hey <laughs> uh but uh my big bone to pick with the first movie was uh red matter this is a it, for those of you who follow jj at all the magical is, mcguffin yes <laughs> unbelievable ridiculous uh, it's first of all it's a rimbaldi device yes from- <laughs> i i don't know if jj abrams had like some sort of like some traumatic dodgeball incident happen when he was a kid <laughs> But he hates giant red balls for hates some reason. Them. He'd be a fan of the prisoner if those balls were <laughs> red. Uh, but yeah, no, it's it's a recycled from baldy thing. Mm-hmm. And here's the thing: is that in Star Trek, if you're a fan of Star Trek, like everything gets described, even you know the fantasy elements, the fictional elements, mm-hmm. you're still getting like a chemical weight for uh, dilithium. You're still mm-hmm. getting like the, its uh, placement on the periodic table. Like everything is like well formed and described and everything Mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden there's this MacGuffin thing developed of like red matter what did it oh red matter why is the world in trouble red matter Mm -hmm. and it's like there's no what the hell red matter like red matter and you couldn't even call it like Castellison or something like that's red matter okay you know what unobtainium is a more oh my god (laughs) yes oh lord and unobtainium is the temporary term you use for a MacGuffin when you have yet to come up with a real name for it yes (laughs) ah so that was my big frustration again I liked both of the new Star Trek movies um I think overall the 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 angle on how to do the reboot uh is successful um, but that that the, the misuse of the MacGuffin, um, mm-hmm. and then the misuse of like the homage to the fans in the second one, mm-hmm. I don't know that I would trust them at this point to come up with an original storyline entirely. I I kind of agree with that because there is like, I, it's not that there is like a history to Star Trek that you need to know, but there is a style to Star yes. Trek that you need to know. Yes. And they've they've altered that style. They've updated it. Mm-hmm. I still think it works and it fits and everything. Well, I mean, the the biggest thing, particularly with the uh, original series Star Trek, which you don't see in the movies, is just the idea of exploration. Yeah, like they you it's never a huge theme. you never see them going anywhere new. You never see them going like off to some distant galaxy. And yes, or sorry, not distant galaxy, different star. They're all within this galaxy. <laughs> I know my track. <laughs> um, and okay, fine. Um, he doesn't. He doesn't get the five-year exploration mission until the end of Into Darkness. But maybe this is where it starts. Maybe, but like the whole point of of Starfleet was exploration. Yeah. Um, and particularly um, ships like the Enterprise. Like the Enterprise was made as an exploratory vessel. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you can find places like the city on the edge of forever. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
V'ger. I know that some people with the first movie... I like, I this, like, like that. I like the first movie. V'ger is an incredible character, if I may. Yeah, oh, absolutely. It just blew my mind. Now, like, if you go back and watch, I think the only fault, really, to my mind, with that first movie is... It was edited when special effects were still it, kind of new. The the pacing was definitely off in that movie. Because they were just showing the effect shots. Like, yeah. This like, is incredible, right? Right. Well, I think it was also coming off of uh, 2001, <laughs> which did a lot of those very long, lingering effect shots mm-hmm. to create this atmosphere, particularly for... Well, like, the thing with 2001 is that 2001 is very much more an atmosphere movie... Exactly. ...than it is a story movie. Yes. Um... I'm still not even sure I get the story all the way. Yeah. He's looking at himself, and he's old. Yeah. I'm not sure. um, Whereas Star Trek is usually much more story-driven. So to have, like, these very atmospheric, long, lingering shots, it kind of of disturbs the pacing. What's going on with the story? Yeah. Yeah. Like, and especially when you have one as intriguing as the story with V'ger. Oh, fantastic story. or Or, like, the conflict between Kirk and Decker... And Ilea getting killed and then brought back as like this android clone awesome. as the mouthpiece of Vijay. This was an intriguing story. This was a provocative story. I wanted to know more about it. Incredible. And I still have like a theory in the back of my head that somehow Vijay kind of started the Borg. Well, they've they've done that. Oh, they've they did. That. I uh, there was a um they they sort of did that in a little bit of a a backstory in a in a computer game a while ago. Oh. I think it was called Star Trek Borg, where they sort of worked V'ger into the backstory of the oh. Borg. Oh, well, there you go. Because, mm-hmm. see, I always kind of thought maybe V'ger could be, like, great-granddaddy of the Borg or something. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know. But I guess they did that in the game. Well, there. So and I've recreated the wheel again. Roll on that. <laughs> Uh, and Jan is saying, off topic, Moon was an amazing science oh, fiction. Oh, Moon was incredible. I loved Moon. Moon, oh. If, you ha- if you're out there and you have not seen Moon, oh. Yeah. And they're moody, yeah. atmospheric, and there's And story. an intriguing story. Uh, yeah. It was, had all the ingredients. Everything was there. Uh, directed by um, David Bowie's son. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Check it out online, I'm to be or whatever. It's David Bowie's son, and it's his directing debut, I think, or at least feature directing debut. Oh, wow. And he's got a new movie that just came out. If anyone jumps on I'm to be, I can't remember. Uh, and it might have come out a little bit ago. I might have. But uh, <laughs> find, <laughs> find out what his next film was. Light of the King is saying, Loving this chat, you guys are so funny. You need to take your sci fi joy and laughter on the road. <laughs> <laughs> I say yes. I I'm okay with that. On bicycles, like how do we hit this road? What do you? I, I no well, hoverboards. There you go. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I fell for that. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> when when uh, I think it was Funny or Die did yeah. that that hoverboard hoax. I was so excited for like a millisecond. I saw him like yeah, fine. Oh no, 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 no. So sad. <laughs> <laughs> um. But yes, uh, Moon, fantastic movie. Love um, Moon. Really love Moon. Yeah, two thousand one was creepy. Yeah, uh, and Yana saying, and then he did Source Code after Moon. Source Code, yes. Okay. That's I, the one. I haven't seen Source Code. Yeah, um, that's the one where, with uh, Jake Gyllenhaal in a time loop, right? I believe that is the. For some reason, I'm thinking that might not be it, but that's what I'm thinking it is. It's okay. the time loop with Jake Gyllenhaal. Okay. Um. So if it is the time loop with Jake Gyllenhaal, uh, I I really enjoyed that one actually. Uh, mm-hmm. I I don't. I, I don't know. I could see where people might not connect with it, but I actually, it felt powerful to me about having like this moment and reliving it and <laughs> trying to get it right. Okay. Uh, so I really connect with that. And the idea that I'm actually dead and I'm in this like Jacob's Ladder kind of like world right now. Okay. Jan is saying that, yes, that is particular. That is, that is, that is the okay. movie we're, we're talking about. Okay, good. Thank we got you. it right. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, he's definitely proved his mettle. Um, I hope he sticks with sci-fi. Can't wait to see what he does next. Uh, when your dad is David Bowie, I guess you end up pretty creative. Probably. Yeah. Um, and Temple is asking, are you mixing up Looper with Source Code? Uh, no. Looper is... No. Uh, Looper different. Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm a not, huge... Not really so much a time loop so much as, like... An alternate timeline. Yeah. Uh, yes. Mm-hmm. Even though it's called Looper. Right. <laughs> but, I mean, Looper is a specific title for a person who yeah. does, like, 
I wouldn't even say like I mean what they do kind of creates a time loop. I kind of wish that we could just like can we queue up that trailer? Let's play the clip. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> if only I had thought to plan ahead. <laughs> um, because uh, I would definitely recommend Looper if you haven't seen Looper. Um, it's one of those. I went to see. It it's with a, a very of mine. intriguing story. It's an extremely intriguing story. I went to see it with a friend of mine. He's also a huge uh, diehard sci-fi fan, um, but he has a very specific ideas of how time works mm. and how time travel works and he was not happy with the story and the way it dealt with time he said it was a little too fast and loose and he just couldn't get on board with that and i respect his opinion and he was right about the uh, points that he brought up no but, i i agree there were some points where like that seemed like they were sort of playing fast and loose with the rules but i kind of think that you know uh Let's let's look optimistically into the future. Into to to the few few future. Um, uh, when time travel becomes possible and an actual science and everything, um, I do think that there will be room for flexibility. Like there will be some rules, but it might be a little bit more like flight. Like uh, you can glide, you can have a propeller-driven flight system, you can use jets, uh, you can be the helicopter, you can have hovering jet. Like Harrier jets, Harrier, mm, right? Yeah. Um, so I think that time will become more of an organic structure and not as rigid as we might see it as today. So also, I end up working, I don't know about you, but I work with time travel oh, concepts I, a lot. I, I love work. working with time travel concepts. It's, yeah. To me, uh, it's fantastic. But I really think that there's some room for like organic movement or pliability within time and time travel mm -hmm. and i think that that's what looper kind of plays with in the movie so if you're mm -hmm. not that into time travel you don't dislike it but you're not like thinking about it all the time and, and like what would happen to the glass of water if it got sent back uh you're not gonna have a problem with looper it'll just be like oh neat there's time travel and there's looper. that's a, that's an interesting idea about how time travel is more pliable and more organic than maybe most sci-fi writers portray it as. I will give you the... Well... Like, like I mean, um, same same thing with uh, Back to the Future, yeah. where, like, they, they, they talk about, like, creating paradoxes that destroy the universe, but yet throughout that whole movie, they are... Um, they're creating paradoxes left and right. Yeah. Like... And, and the universe seems to be correcting for it. Like, the parents don't get together, then the children disappear, and so be it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there's, I think there's room for it. So, I really recommend Looper. Um, I, I thought it was a compelling story, uh, and well told, yeah. frankly. Uh, Brick was his, that director's first film. Oh, okay, okay. So you know he's a he's a good story craftsman. Go back and see Brick, another Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Gordon who I'm also a big fan of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ever I since, love uh, also Shy-Fi, Third Rock from the Sun. Loves Third Rock. Yeah. Loves me some Third Rock. Um, One of my favorite jokes in that whole show yeah? was uh, when William Shatner uh, guest starred on it as the, uh, the big head. <laughs> um, and, uh, like, he's... He's another alien, yeah. and he he comes to meet them, and he meets with uh, John Lithgow, yeah. and he gets off the plane. And he's like, "It was the craziest thing. I thought I saw a creature on the wing of that plane." <laughs> and then John Lithgow says, "So did I," because <laughs> they both did that story in Twilight Zone. <laughs> Uh, William Shatner did it in the TV show. John Lithgow did it in the movie. Yeah. Really. And it was like one of the most brilliant in-jokes I had ever seen. And I just about died. Uh, speaking of funny sci-fi shows, uh, are you watching The Neighbors? Oh, God, I love The Neighbors. And I love that there was the, the big reveal of the at the end of last season. Because I... I'll, I'll be honest, that's one of the shows that's building up on my DVR right now because mm -hmm. there is a lot of great stuff and I have been yeah. pretty busy lately. Mm -hmm. But Neighbors is building up the season. But at the end, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, George Takei, right? Yeah, George Takei and Mark Hamill. Yes. It, it was, uh, that was a fantastic They're one. They're the commanders. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> yeah, like I'm, I'm watching this season and it's just as funny. Like The thing I love about the Neighbors is that they sort of take the concept of like um like you have like a nice suburban neighborhood and some new people move in and oh my god they're aliens <laughs> like we like that that's an it's an old concept it's pretty yeah. funny and this one is aliens have come to earth 
And they, rather than integrate into society, have set up their own closed gate suburban community <laughs> and live their lives sort of very insular. And then a family of humans move in. <laughs> and so now the humans are the oddballs. <laughs> it's a it's an excellent setup. It's really quite inspired. Um, everything I've seen, like I said, I'm a little behind at this point, but really, it, uh, it's brilliant. got it's got great quirks, uh, mm-hmm. like all all the alien characters they name themselves after famous uh, sports stars <laughs> so like uh, the main alien character his name is Larry Bird his wife is Jackie Joyner Kersey <laughs> uh, their sons are uh, Dick Butkus uh, and oh god I can't remember the other one um, oh jeez I can't remember but it's, but, yeah. it's not the only thing. It's just like finding them, misinterpreting. They're trying to be as human as possible. So they're observing, but they're observing from an alien mind and an alien consciousness mm-hmm. and trying to be like, oh, this is what normal people do. We shall also eat the chicken, right? <laughs> and and they'll just end up doing it in some ridiculous alien fashion. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's always like this weirdly exaggerated way that like to an outsider, like, yeah, actually, that would kind of make sense. <laughs> Like it's very brilliant. Yeah, and it and it really, uh, you know, in in a philosophical sense or something, it does kind of inspire you to kind of look at, you know, what are you doing every day? Uh, what it, what kind of things are you taking for granted in your life or performing over and over again? And it kind of makes you like looking again. Kind of gives you that alien consciousness. Yeah, it, a little it, bit. it does sort of make you like second guess a lot of yeah. what you do in your life. Why like, do I brush my teeth this way? You mm-hmm. know, maybe there's another way to do it or something. Why do I put so much emphasis on? facebook and twitter yeah why do i do that Mm -hmm. that's a really good question (laughs) but yeah so uh i recommend it i don't know maybe you know uh if it's getting the kind of ratings treatment and response that it should but uh it's gotten enough to get picked up for another season so that's something excellent perfect on on abc no less so you know that's a that's a big deal that is fantastic Mm-hmm. Uh, and, a, and a show and not necessarily directly sci-fi, but about sci-fi. Wait, wait a sec. Uh, Light of the King is asking, oh. Josh, are you going to do a new version of your book, Ben? Yes. At some point, uh, I do want to. I do want to redo it. Uh, it's still something I just need to find the time to do. Um, but I do want to redo it, um, just because uh, there is there's kind of a, a very tragic flaw in the book, hmm. which is that it was written in 2004 and is set specifically in 2008 against ah. against a hypothetical presidential election, ah, okay. which has since come and gone. <laughs> <laughs> so it feels very awkward and outdated now. <laughs> so I want, I want to change it so that it's now in a hypothetical near future that isn't specific. Okay. That doesn't have a specific date attached to it, and and it's really just more like uh, a cosmetic change to some things. Like I don't, I don't intend to rewrite the book, but I do actually need to reconstruct it, which takes a little time. <laughs> yeah, any 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 time. Speaking as a writer, any time you go in and it's even just a little bit of a change or a tweak, you kind of have to comb through everything yeah. to make sure that you're covering every instance of that right throughout. right exactly um uh so uh in Jan was saying discussion about time travel without mentioning back to the future we did mention back to the future but very briefly yeah we can do i mean i just give it as a given that there's you know just a delorean in every garage. Well, yeah. Actually, yeah. Uh, the town that I grew up in, uh, we had a local uh, DeLorean collectors group. So every month, uh, we would see a parade of DeLoreans drive down the main street. <laughs> and it was I'm ridiculous. seriously jealous. It was ridiculous. Because, like, as, as cool as that car looks in the movie, mm-hmm. seeing it up close and for real, you realize just what a stupid concept this car was. <laughs> And why it never sold. <laughs> I, I gotta tell you, though, I love it. It's still my dream car. Mm-hmm. I'll blame Br- Back to the Future for this. Yeah. But I, it is still, like, absolutely 100%. Like, when I have a disposable income, one of the very first purchases I'll make mm-hmm. is a DeLorean. Fair enough. I, I gotta and, have it. Okay, Temple makes a good point. According to Star Trek, we had a eugenics war in 1999, which we know didn't happen. Um, Do we know that? Do we? Did, was it maybe underground? Well, it no, it, it would have been pretty uh, obvious because we would have had a uh, Khan Noonien Singh take over the world. Oh. Yeah. 
Maybe he that, has, and we're all in like a matrix now. Whoa! Like, everything's <laughs> normal. Mm mm. Mm mm. Oh, wow. You yeah. just blew my mind. Ow. That's how I work. <laughs> Notice this but, hand movement with how I work. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's. Uh, it is a good point, like, maybe, like, just let it go, let the uh, little inconsistency go, but you know what? It bugs me. Yeah. And I'm the writer, and I have this opportunity to change it, because it is self-published, and it's out of print now, and I can bring it back, and, like, this is something I can do, and I'm like, you know what? I want to do it, so that, th- so that the story does become more timeless, and, and becomes more accessible. And, and again, as a creator, you know, first you want to create for yourself. You want to be enjoying uh, your creation. Because mm-hmm. if, it's, if you're not, then is anybody else? You always create for yourself first. Right. And, and, like, that's why I want to redo it. Because, I mean, I'll tell you, I had a blast writing this book. Like, it was probably the, it was probably the fastest uh, I had uh, uh, gotten through it writing wow. anything like wow. I, I went from hey I've got a neat idea to published book in a year that's incredible that mm-hmm. is some speed uh huh <laughs> and Jan is asking any words about catching fire oh yes uh, I'm sorry we've we've been distracted by oh. sci-fi but yes we, we should talk about catching fire a little bit catching yeah. fire is like sci-fi right it is it's yeah. dystopian future yeah. um, and Jan Jan had emailed me uh, talking about uh, catching fire mm-hmm. and um First of all, don't do it, and if you do, drop and roll. Stop, drop, and roll. Stop, drop, and roll. That's what we learned in school. Yeah. Uh, where is... And and just say no to forest fires if you're a big bear. Where is the email? Come on. There we go. So, uh, uh, yeah, so Jan was talking a little bit about the ending of Catching Fire. Ah, do we, and and how he thought it felt like a dream at first. Do we need to do a spoiler alert or anything? If we, we're talking about the end, we might want to do a little bit of a spoiler alert if we're talking about the ending. Do we do that with like a visual dance, like as an interpretive dance? No, or yeah. anything. Oh, oh, light of the king is leaving. Bye, bye, light. Light. Uh, Catch you on the light side. Uh, and Jan is saying I'm, we should really, we should really do a, an episode about how to start writing a book or a screenplay if that hasn't been done already. Well, um, I did talk a little bit about the writing process with uh, Kelly um, back when uh, Darkling was our book of the month. Because it was my one, the one time when I actually had the author of the book of the month on the show. <laughs> because she happens to be a friend of mine. <laughs> uh, I recently, if I can self-plug a little bit... Mm-hmm. I recently started doing a couple uh, journal entries, basically, uh, on my site about... Because I was kind of thinking about it, and I just kind of wanted to share and and maybe start a discussion. So if you'd like to join in, um, go to hashingpost.com. Okay. And And I'll put a link to that on the uh, Facebook page, too. And I've I've already got a couple journal entries that I put in there about, like, uh, the writing process and, like, kind of, like, what goes into that, uh, how inspiration is involved... And I'd love to hear from you guys your thoughts um, and your take on it, and then any kind of questions or comments, and that I can use that for future uh, journal entries, and we can kind of get a dialogue going. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll definitely like pass that on to everybody, and hopefully you'll get some more readers and some more fans out of it. Yeah, I'd love mm-hmm. to. I'd love to have you guys. This is already so much fun, and yeah. hearing all the questions and everything, love yeah. it. Yeah, this is a this has been a good time, but we're uh, I I let this run a little bit longer than normal because we had some technical difficulties about halfway through there, but um, we should be getting to a point where we're wrapping it up and um, gotcha. and uh, yes, we were going to talk catching fire, but we're kind of running out of time. But Do we have quick thoughts? What was the basic question? Uh, I don't. I think uh, in the email he was talking about how um, he felt the ending. Uh, initially felt like a dream felt like a dream and i i i get that is this uh, have you read the book i don't know i guess that would be my question because it it and it is a little bit dreamlike because there is sleep involved um mm-hmm. i think and i had the same feeling when i finished reading the book was a little bit like yeah what what how much of what happened was actually real exactly and and i think it was it was nice that they did that because like we're sort of going we're going along with Katniss through that that disorientation. Exactly. And so I kind of like that it's sort of left um, it it sort of left at least for a little bit like 
is this real? Is this really happening? Because like, even I had that confusion when I was reading the book. Yeah, I absolutely felt that way. Uh, if you haven't read the books, man, I really recommend them. Yeah. Um, they're good reads. They were pretty quick for me. Yeah, um, they're they very quick reads. So I and, would, you know, that's, that's something we could... Uh, we could talk about next month with the uh, big franchises because Hunger Games is definitely one of the big franchises. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I definitely, I don't know if this was part of it, but I am a fan of the second movie more than the first. I am too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I sort of felt like the move, the second movie captured the essence of the book a lot better than the first movie did. Yeah, yeah. I feel the same way. And I also like that they... Uh, I'm going to be slightly insensitive, but I, I hope not. And I have full respect for the struggles uh also i'll be dealing with that in a future journal entry but it kind of felt like the 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 whoever was holding the camera from the first movie was unfortunately uh suffering from seizures or something holding that camera because like even there was a lot of shaky cam in that movie. when she's just sitting and thinking the camera is like this and i was like getting sick in the theater mm-hmm. um and i i'm glad that they kind of did away with that um but that was that was probably my biggest critique of the first movie, uh, and it, it got in the way of me even getting to the point where I was like, "Well, they're not exactly following." But like, but yeah, the shaky cam was beasts. very distracting. Oh, the mutations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, yeah. Like, I, I kind of, I appreciate that they didn't. They probably didn't have a big enough budget to do them well, and so to yeah. cover up for that, they kept them in the dark so you couldn't see them very well. Yeah. But at the same time, they were such a big element to the story yeah. that it really felt distracting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Temple makes a good point. I think uh, part of the dreamy nature of her is her having post-traumatic stress disorder. hmm And that's very true. Um, mm-hmm. And I like that, particularly in the second book and second movie, as they deal a lot with uh, the PTSD. And yeah. And poor Peta, what he went through and what he's going to go through. Oh God, that poor kid. If you haven't read, I would definitely say give him a read. They're, <laughs> yeah. they're a good read. Uh, Eva is saying, "I love the ending because you could see the change in Katniss's eyes. She wasn't a victim anymore, and that's absolutely that last shot of Katniss. She was catching fire. What? <laughs> Did that just happen? <laughs> oh God! Oh my God!" <laughs> Yeah, good catch, Eva. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so as I was saying, we we let this run a bit long because of uh, technical difficulties halfway through. But we sorry, are, sorry, yeah, it's all his fault. <laughs> Guilty. But uh, we are going to have to uh, bring this to a close, unfortunately. But it's been a wonderful time. It was great having you on. Thanks, here, Josh. Jay. I was really I happy really to appreciate be here. it. Yeah. yeah, this has been a lot of fun. And uh, hopefully we can have you back another time. Yeah, I'd love other to. Stuff. I would love to, especially um, if you keep the you know uh, studio audience of kicking clowns. Oh, going. absolutely! Yeah, that's no, fantastic. They're never going away. That's that, excellent. That's in my contract now. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but um, now I see they're having a discussion about um, PTSD in the uh, in in the chat. And please, by all means, keep it going. Uh, keep the yeah. conversation going on um, on Facebook and on Twitter. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, and, come check me out and yeah, check out Gabe at what is it? The Hashing Post? Hashing Post. Hashing Post. Dot com. Dot com. You find um, us on uh, Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter, everywhere. I need a Tumblr for this show. I think. So. Yeah. 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 Um. And so uh, I'm I'm just going to uh, leave it at that. Uh, thank you again, Gabe. Thank you. Thank you, Jan, Eva, Temple. I stole the one ring, Light of the King. Uh, who else has been helping out here? Like those are those It's been are really great real- meeting you guys. Uh, Rovan Deer, thank you, uh, newbie, uh, new person coming in. Um, and yes, uh, this is this has been a lot of fun, and we'll be back uh, next week. I next week is uh, the thirtieth. Um, it's close enough to the end. Maybe we'll discuss Orphans of the Sky then. Uh, I don't know if we'll... We probably won't have a winner for Rewrite Tolkien at that point. We might have to wait another week for that. I get a chance to enter. I didn't even know. Yes, you can totally enter. Um, And so... uh, We'll we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Maybe we will talk Orphans of the Sky uh, next week. Um, So so I'll get on reading it. Everybody else get on reading it if you haven't yet. Um, 
That way we're not doing Rewrite Tolkien and Book of the Month in the same episode, because that, <laughs> that takes up a lot of time, and we can focus on other things. So, um, might have another guest next week. We'll see. I'm trying to get more and more guests for the show. Nice. Mm-hmm. Nice. Uh, Rovandir is saying, new person coming, new person staying. Yay! Right on! Welcome. Thank you! Thank you. Um... So thank you again so much, everybody. Um, I will see you all next week, and never stop reading.